I like that phrase, and there I will speak to you. Right at the mercy seat. So if you've never looked at that before, um, that was the Ark of the Covenant. God gave uh, uh, Moses specific instructions to build this ark or a box, a container that he would have a few certain items put into this and that ark would contain the very presence of God. And it was heavily guarded and heavily uh, uh, um, veiled, literally, things covering God's presence. The Bible says that God is holy and no unclean thing can ever come to him, ever. That has not changed. That's as true today as it was then. And God had to do something in order to get his people back to him because we had wandered away, right? And God sent his own son to take our punishment. Now, Jesus did not get out early on good behavior. He didn't. He had to fully satisfy the sentence of death for your sin. Completed it. God is just. And that's why when we sing songs like Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Because if no one died for the penalty of sin, you surely would. You would be separated from God. But we have this really good news that Jesus paid the penalty of sin in your life. And through undeserved favor, God gave you a gift of right standing with him. He looks at you and says, you are a-okay, not based upon what you have or have not done, based solely upon the fact that Jesus Christ paid your penalty in full. So the Ark of the Covenant, I just wanted to explain that real quick. <laughs> so the Ark of the Covenant before Jesus was the only place the presence of God could reside. Why? Because they were all sinners. They could not go to God. There was, uh, there was no mercy allotted to them. In order to even approach that ark, they had to kill an innocent animal and take its blood and do that. Why? Because the wages of sin is death. Has to be satisfied. No way around it. And as we explained last week, death is not the cessation of life. That's a man-made idea. An eternal God never created something that ceases to exist that's fashioned after him. Right? God made man in his image. You don't ever stop. Death, from a biblical perspective, 
is a separation. When you die physically, you will separate from your body. When you die spiritually, because of sin, you separate yourself from God and his promises. Separation. That's why we're all not dead today. (laughs) Just merely separated from what we could have through our sin. Unless, of course, we've been redeemed by Christ. Amen. Amen. And then he brings us back to the place that he wants to have us, in right standing with him, a full allotment to his blessings. That's why you don't have to work to be blessed. It costs you nothing. You can't earn God's blessing. You can't be good enough for it. Say it again. You can't be good enough to be blessed. You being good isn't going to help any more or less. Some of you should smile. Be like, seriously? Yes. Yes. Well, how was church? It was amazing. What did he say? Something like, I don't have to work anymore to be blessed? What else? I don't know. I forgot after that. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. So the Ark of the Covenant held God's presence. And as in much of the Old Testament, it's a type and a parallel to help us understand how God works. And the Ark of the Covenant really resembles you. And we're gonna talk about that because I don't think today we truly understand what we got. It's like having a million dollars in the bank but you can't find your debit card. <laughs> and do you any you like I don't know. I, I know it's there but I can't use it. I lost my debit card. Go to Joshua chapter 3, Joshua chapter 3. So uh, I have a lot written down here. And if you get on Facebook, facebook.com slash inspire the church, you can look at everything I'm looking at because I post my notes up there. Like it, you'll always get my notes, the videos, all that stuff. And I've got a lot written down. Uh, I'm going to go through uh, part of that here. And then real quick, I just want to quickly explain the parallels between you and the Ark of the Covenant. So the Ark of the Covenant contained the Ten Commandments, God's law. The Bible says in the new covenant he's going to write with man that he'll write his laws on your heart. You see, God's commandments are still in you. They're written on your heart. Not on tables of stone. In your soul. Aaron's rod... Aaron's rod is in the Ark of the Covenant. That uh, 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 symbolized authority and power. That is in you. Right? In my name, you will cast out devils. Come on. There, what was different about Jesus when Jesus preached? He speaks with authority, they said. Unlike anyone else. Why? Why? Because he had the Zoe life of God. I'm going to tell you today, you guys are the living Ark of the Covenant. If you're a believer. If you're not, you're going to be one. You'll you'll want it anyways. This is awesome. So Aaron's rod, which is in the Ark of the Covenant, symbolized authority and power. Miraculous power. God told him, just take that rod out and show Pharaoh what's up. He did, and Pharaoh went, what's up? That authority and power is in you if you are in him. Manna, there was a bowl of manna in there. That's your daily nourishment. 
You have that inside of you, a daily nourishment from God. That's why often we sit there and say, commune with God every day in the secret place in your heart because there is daily nourishment in there for you, manna. Remember what Jesus said? I am the bread of life. I am the manna that came down from heaven. Two angels sit above the Ark of the Covenant. Huh? Psalm 91, anybody? And he has given his angels charge over you, lest you should dash your foot against us. Come on. He's like, I've given angels so you don't stub your toe. Sometimes I'm like, where were you on that one? (laughs) Can I get an amen? (laughs) Y'all are sleeping. All right, Joshua chapter 3. Did you find it yet? Joshua chapter 3. Joshua chapter 3. Now listen, you Ark of Covenants, listen. Yay, ma'am. Someone's waving a hanky. Listen. The power and presence of God in you will make a way when there is no way. All you have to do is step out and obey in faith. Until you take that step, nothing happens. You sit there and say, well, God, it's not happening. He said, I know, you got to go forward. Listen, but listen, listen to what happened. Listen to what happened when they took the Ark of the Covenant and moved forward in obedience with God. Joshua chapter 3, verse 13. This is Joshua speaking. Of course, they put the priests out there. (laughs) The priests will carry the Ark of the Lord, the Lord of all the earth. As soon as their feet touch the water, the flow of water will be cut off upstream and the river will stand up like a wall. So the people left their camp to cross the Jordan and the priests who were carrying the Ark of the Covenant went ahead of them. Listen, listen. It was harvest season and the Jordan was overflowing its banks. Huh? Just like God. I'm going to wait till there's a flood. And then I'm going to tell you to cross. Couldn't we wait till winter and there's just a trickle? (laughs) Then you can just tiptoe across. No, he waits till, in other words, you're like, God, this is such bad timing. I can't do that now. This isn't going to work and this isn't going to work. And I don't have this and I don't got that. How could I do it? Well, you little Ark of the Covenant. Just obey and step out in faith. You literally had to go get your feet wet before something happened. I'm telling you guys, you get your feet wet and the waters will stand up. And not only that, think of everybody else behind you that's going to pass on dry ground because you obeyed and stepped out in faith. Anybody get that? Seems that way. So, so, so I was in Montana, right? I'm in Montana, and I, I want to be a preacher. And God says, well, and I'm like, because uh, I had always fought being a pastor. I don't know. Why do we do that? Like, fight who we're really supposed to be. Like, like, like we'll do anything but who we're supposed to do, Right? So, so I'm, I'm there and I'm like, all right, Lord, I will do it. Anywhere but Lake Havasu. <laughs> Never say that. <laughs> uh, just word of advice. And, and, and I knew it as well as he did. And so this opportunity comes up for me to move back to Lake Havasu. Because I tried to do my own thing, you guys. I tried to do my own thing, my own way, not obey. 
and them waters never stood up. <laughs> and so I started wandering in the desert. It's so not fun. <laughs> you get thirsty, tired, nothing works right. Everything just seems to come up that short. It's like, I can almost reach it. It's gone. And I had this opportunity to move back. And, and the job, I think it was like 11 bucks an hour. And I had two babies and a wife. I'd be like, well, I'll be making $11 an hour. We're going to move to a really nice RV park. Stay in a glorious double wide. I mean, single wide. Did I say double single wide? And we can stay there for three months, then we gotta find something else. Isn't that exciting? Not to a wife, it's not exciting. You know. But I had to step out in faith. And when I stepped out in faith and obeyed, not seeing anything, none of this existed. And consistently, time and time again, the provision came. We filled our last building up, and we're like, we need a new building, but we don't have any money. <laughs> I was depressed. I'm like, we got all these people coming. I mean, we, this is about half this size. There's all these people coming. What are we going to do? I went to look for places to rent, and they were like, yeah, it's about a buck, buck and a quarter a square foot. I'm like, that'll be like $3,500, $4,000 a month to rent. Small business owners, you there? Yeah. It's awful. And you know what happened? Through obedience, God said, call this guy. I called that guy. And pretty much, we ended up here, and the owner of the building uh, uh, became the bank for the building, and we bought it. We bought the building. We own it. We don't rent. There should be a couple more hankies out there. Come on. <laughs> I'd much rather own my house than rent it. Come on. So, so I... I consistently have to tell myself because I have just made the, I made the decision a couple months ago. I've been a volunteer, full-time volunteer for the last seven years that we started the church. And the Lord said, you got to step out and uh, go full-time at the church. I'm like, you got to tell Jenny. <laughs> I mean, that's all fine and dandy, Lord. You tell her first. <laughs> and God had been speaking to both of us. And after we stepped out, and, and, and I tried to quit my job anyways. It's like Egypt. Let me go. <laughs> provision after provision after provision. It doesn't exist until you take a step of faith, you guys. Yeah, it's there. Just get your feet wet. All right. My arcs of the covenant. Number two. Listen, listen. Because you're a carrier of the divine presence of God, the waters will part when you get your feet wet. Number two, there will be wisdom and protection. 1 Samuel chapter 5, verse 1. 1 Samuel chapter 5. Jump over there. 1 Samuel chapter 5. 1 Samuel chapter 5. Listen to this. This is awesome. It's like one of my favorites. 1 Samuel chapter 5. After the Philistines captured the ark of God, right, they thought, man, this thing's amazing. Let's go get it. Now, let me tell you how the Philistines got the ark of the covenant. The Bible says that in the days of Saul, they did not consult the ark of the covenant. 
They didn't try to get into the presence of God and get his plan and wisdom. They just kind of went out and tried it. They were consistently defeated. And, and they said, let's take the Ark of the Covenant with us. That'll help us win. And they went out there and they got the smack down and they took the Ark of the Covenant. So the Philistines got the Ark of the Covenant, right? After the Philistines captured the Ark of God, they took it from the battleground of Ebenezer to the town of Ashdod. They carried the Ark of God into the temple of Dagon and placed it beside an idol of Dagon. But when the citizens of Ashdod went to see it the next morning, Oh. Dagon had fallen with his face to the ground in front of the ark of the Lord. <laughs> Bow, Dagon. <laughs> now, now listen, listen. So they took Dagon and put him back up again. Well, that's all right. Anything can happen. But the next morning, the same thing happened. Dagon had fallen, or had fallen face down before the ark of the Lord again. This time, his head and hands had broken off and they were lying in the doorway. And only the trunk of his body was left intact. You don't mess with the Ark of the Covenant. You don't mess with the power and presence of God. Listen, Arks. <laughs> Man, you can walk and get into some places and they won't like it. <laughs> Why? Because that presence and power of God's on the inside of you. It's going to upset Dagon. It's going to take down the idols. Man, you might have some stuff in your house, and it's not, like, good. <laughs> and it's upsetting, right? And it's like something's not right about that. Mm-hmm. You're going to take that idol and smash it. Huh? Why? Because it's the power and presence of God inside you. Now listen, jump over to 2 Samuel chapter 5. 2 Samuel chapter 5. 2 Samuel. That's just the next one over. Chapter 5. And verse 17. Right. 2 Samuel chapter 5, verse 17. Closed out my Bible app. Whoops. All right, 2 Samuel chapter 5, verse 17. I know. You can only be fancy to a certain point. 2 Samuel chapter 5, verse 17. Listen. When the Philistines heard that David had been anointed king of Israel, they mobilized all their forces to capture him. But David was told they were coming, so he went into the stronghold. The Philistines arrived and spread out across the valley of Rephaim. So David asked the Lord... Should I go out and fight the Philistines? Will you hand them over to me? The Bible consistently shows that David would go before the Ark of the Covenant. That's like you praying, getting alone with God and saying, Lord, should I go? Is this my fight? Is this my job? Is this my time? Is that my path? Right? Isn't that what James says? If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of the Father. Amen. Why? Because it's right inside you. The Lord replied to David, yes, go ahead. I will certainly hand them over ahead of you. So David went to Baal, Perazim, and defeated the Philistines there. The Lord did it, David exclaimed. He burst through my enemies like a raging flood. Let's jump down to verse 22. But after a while, the Philistines returned again and spread out across the valley of Rephaim. And again, David asked the Lord, what to do. He didn't just say, well, God told me last time, so I'm going to go again this time. Because that's what Saul did. And he always got smacked down. Now listen. And again, David asked the Lord what to do. Do not attack them straight on, the Lord replied. Instead, circle around behind and attack them near the poplar trees. They were very popular. When you hear a sound like marching feet in the tops of the poplar trees, be on the alert. That's the signal. 
that the Lord is moving ahead of you to strike down the Philistine army. So David did what the Lord commanded, and he struck down the Philistines all the way from Gibeon to Gezer. <laughs> Why? Because he's consulting the power and presence of God. But he had to go to an Ark of the Covenant. You don't have to go that far. You don't have to sacrifice anything. No blood involved. Thank you, Jesus. I'd not be a Christian if I had to do that. But like, I don't know. I'll try to find a different way. Gross. But listen, listen. There is wisdom and protection. God will frustrate your enemy's plans and give you his plans for victory. Because Why? Because you're an Ark of the Covenant. You carry God's power and presence on the inside of you. And last but not least, there is a blessing on your home because of that power and presence. Huh? 2 Samuel chapter 6, verse 11. Check this out. Just go one chapter over. So, so David went there. After the whole Dagon thing, right? Uh, they're like, get rid of this ark. We don't even want it. And everywhere that ark went in the enemy's camp, it, it ruined everything. People were breaking out with like tumors and everything else. They're like, ah! Oh! And, and everybody, I mean, after a while, the Philistine people went to their leaders and begged them not to put the ark in their town. And what'd they do? So they ended up sending it back to the Israelites with a guilt offering. They pretty much paid the Israelites to take it back. <laughs> we'll give it back to you and some money. <laughs> Sorry. And the Ark of the Covenant only made it so far. And so David, when he became king, wanted to bring that Ark of the Covenant back into Israel because he knew of the power and protection. He knew of the, he knew of the, he knew the benefits of it. And he wanted to get that thing in Jerusalem as quick as possible. Well, it took a pit stop at some dude's house. Check it out. Verse 11. Verse, uh, start in verse 10. So David decided not to move the ark of the Lord into the city of David. Instead, he took it to the house of Obed-Edom of Gath. The ark of the Lord remained there in Obed-Edom's house for three months, and the Lord blessed Obed-Edom and his entire household. I mean, so he gets the ark of the covenant, the power and presence of God in there, and his house starts getting blessed. Everything about his house, finances, Kids, why? Because he had the power and presence of God and all the benefits along with that. Ver, uh, David sees this, verse 12. Then King David was told, the Lord has blessed Obed-Edom's house and everything he has because of the ark of God, verse 12. So David went there and brought the ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom into the city of David with the great celebration. Why? Because, man, he's like, I'm going to take this home. <laughs> Woo! But listen, Christians are carriers of the power and presence of God. You are a living Ark of the Covenant. You have God's power and protection, the blessing of God on your home. You have the way where there is no way residing right on the inside. And you just take that step of faith and get your feet wet and the water stand up. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, so much for your grace and wisdom. Thank you, Lord, for the blessing of God in and on our lives because of Jesus Christ. Father, help us to be more sensitive. Help us to be better listeners. Help us to consult with your power and presence inside of us. Help us to be mindful of your kingdom. Father, I ask you for grace and mercy. 
that we can find our way to you. Lord, that we can see you in everything we do. Remind us when we start to wander. Remind us when we start to forget that you live right on the inside of us. That we won't frustrate the grace of God, but we'll actively participate with it. We pray for all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.